So I, I, we're not live yet, but I'm going to just go ahead and start. But if you know me, I always start, you know, I, I show up right at the minute I'm supposed to show up. So I apologize if you've been waiting for too long. Uh, well, great. Hey, what a great turnout. It's great to see everybody here today. And it's just on, on cue, we have, we have the, you know, the most famous weatherman in Boston history here, and it starts to sprinkle a little bit outside, right? So <laughs> we got some weather. But uh, I am delighted to welcome you all here today to the kickoff spring fling. Uh, thank you to the planning committee, comprised of the Council of Aging team members, as well as the board members, to both the COA advisory board and to the friends of the COA. Uh, we appreciate the friends' sponsorship of this new event. We are particularly grateful to Patty Marsh of West Newbury, who frequents this beautiful senior community center, and to Mary Kelly, who collaborated to bring our distinguished guest here today. Harvey Leonard and White. Oh, absolutely. Harvey Leonard, widely regarded as the Dean of Boston Meteorologists, is WCVB's Channel 5's Chief Meteorolo Meteorologist Emeritus. After a 50-year career in meteorology, with more than 45 of those years forecasting weather in the New England and 20 of those at WCVB, Harvey retired from the helm of Storm Team 5 in May of 2022 and tra transitioned into his role as uh, into this uh, Emeritus role. In his new position, Harvey gets to continue to serve the community with important information as a periodic contributor to Storm Team 5's coverage and engage in community speaking appearances like the one today. We welcome Harvey to New Report today to present our changing climate. And I just want to say for anyone who kind of grew up here uh, in the area, not just in New Report, but in Massachusetts, I mean, you knew it was Bruce Regler at Channel 4, it was Dickie <laughs> Albert at Channel 5, and it was Harvey Leonard at WHDH for a long period right. of time. And then That's he right. moved over to WCVB uh, as well. So it's really thrilling to have you here today, Harvey. And uh, I want to thank you for spending your time with us to share your words of wisdom and insights about this topic uh, that's particularly re relevant in our community. And as you know, being a coastal community, we're so uh, susceptible to a lot of the things going on with uh, climate change here in your report. So again, which is why, again, I think you're seeing the, the turnout that you have here today because this is very top of, uh, top of mind here in your report. But we're also here to present you, and I don't know if it's up here. Is this what this is below me, Paul? <laughs> okay. Uh, we're also presenting you with a hand-carved shorebird created by local artists in hopes that you come back to the Clipper City uh, very soon. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank you that's awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. That's great. So without further ado, Harvey Leonard. Thank you. Ah. Uh, all right. Now. I don't think I need to use this, right, because I have this? Yes. Is that true? Yeah. Great. Okay, awesome. I'm free to move a little bit. Um, thank you to the mayor. Uh, thank you to Patty. Thank you to all of you uh, for inviting me up here today. Uh, this is a great treat for me because, I mean, you live here, so you know how cool Newburyport is. I live in Natick, so it's a little bit of a ride, you know, up here. And so I'm not here as often as I'd like to be, but this is, this is wonderful. And it's great to see all of you. Thank you all for turning out. I see one of the big problems I'm going to have today. Do I look right or do I look left? Or do I look straight ahead? Um, well, camera two, right? <laughs> yeah, right, camera two, camera two. Anyway, um, but uh, anyway, it is great to be here. And yes, the topic is going to be climate change. But we're going to have time for Q&A after I finish chatting. Uh, and I'm going to hang around for a while afterwards if you're here. So I'd like to meet a lot of you. And uh, I really look forward to that uh, as well. So before we get to the topic of climate change, I uh, just wanted to let you know that I have a wonderful title that WCBB was nice enough to give to me. Um, you know, when we talked about finally retiring from you know the main job that I had it was really their idea to have this title of chief meteorologist emeritus and I went whoa <laughs> I thought like you know maybe longtime college professors when they kind of retire get that emeritus but you know I didn't realize that was I guess anything's possible but um, so I still have an ongoing relationship uh, with Channel 5, which is a great station, WCVB. It always has been, really, forever and ever. And uh, everything is still in great hands. The weather department is in great hands. Uh, the chief meteorologist now is Cindy Fitzgibbon. And many of you, if you watch early in the day, you're familiar with Cindy from the eye opener, also at noontime. Cindy is awesome. She's so deserving uh, of the title. 
She's a great, terrific meteorologist, great forecaster, very hard worker, terrific person and great personality. What you see is what you get. And so this has been a great thing for Cindy. This, uh, my retiring has also been a very good thing for Mike Wonkum, who finally got off the weekends, poor guy. Um, I'm sure in the back of his mind he was saying, isn't he ever gonna retire? But uh, anyway, so Mike is Monday through Friday now in the early and late evenings. And uh, A.J. Burnett, uh, I always call him um, our MVP, because if he isn't our most valuable player, he's certainly our most versatile player. And what I mean by that is, uh, A.J. can do the weather just like the rest of uh, the team can, and he does occasionally. But he also can report out in the field during storms. He also is kind of our uh, chief uh, technical person in the weather department, so he kind of keeps everybody up to date on the computer graphic system, and he works with the, our vendor, uh, and then and all of that. He also is the link to the newsroom and the, the web department and all the social media that goes on as well, because now everything is multifaceted, uh, communicating in many different ways and many different forms. Then there's Kellyanne Chickalese, who just recently came back on the air regularly as our weekend morning meteorologist, but of course involved in team coverage and other things. Kellyanne goes to a lot of schools as well. She had her second child. She now has two boys, uh, so she was off for a while. And uh, the newest member of the team is David Williams. He's our weekend evening meteorologist. I've only met David once, but a great guy, very affable. He is still uh, kind of settling into New England, including the weather patterns. Actually, David was born in Queens, New York. I was born in the Bronx in New York. Okay? Okay. Now, anybody else from New York here? Oh, yeah, we do have a couple. Okay. Now, for the rest of you, okay, you were very nice. You didn't sneer or anything. But I have good news for you. I never, ever was a Yankee fan. Okay? All right? Even though I grew up in the Bronx. And the reason is, I'm just old enough so that when I was a little boy, New York had three baseball teams. The New York Yankees in the American League, the New York Giants of the National League, and the Brooklyn Dodgers, also of the National League. And my father, who was a big sports fan, always loved to root for the underdog. And in New York, the Brooklyn Dodgers were the underdog. So we were Brooklyn Dodger fans, not New York. And if you were a Brooklyn Dodger fan, you did not like the Yankees. <laughs> so when I eventually came to New England in 1974, I was already 95% of the way to being a Red Sox fan because I detested the Yankees, <laughs> right? So that, that was easy. Um, so anyway, but so that's where I was. I'll just very, very briefly, because I do want to get into our main topic, um, I always loved the weather, I was always interested in it, but I really, growing up as a little boy in New York, those of you who are old enough to remember Don Kent, yeah. yes. Bob Copeland, by the way, um, I was privileged to be at Bob Copeland's 90th birthday party last June 23rd, okay? Um, and Don, we lost a number of years ago. Uh, great guy, his family gave me a great honor at his funeral, one of the speakers. Uh, which really was a tremendous honor. So you heard the mayor uh, so rightfully mention the names of Bruce Schwegler, Dick Albert, uh, along with me, because we were each at different stations you know, at that time. But all of us, those three of us, people like meteorologists like Barry Burbank, another great guy, all of us have Don Kent and Bob Copeland to thank. And the reason is, even though the field scientifically wasn't as far along in their era, they started New Englanders on a very professional approach to weather casting. So while in other parts of the country, like in the 50s, there were puppets and all sorts of acts, uh, here, professional weather casting was going on with Don and, uh, and with Bob. And so, uh, again, every, all of us who have followed them really have them to thank for it. So I grew up in New York, though, so I didn't have them when I was younger. Uh, in New York, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of professional meteorologists when I was very young. And I didn't know anybody else who had that kind of an interest. It really wasn't until I got into college at City College of New York when I became a meteorology major that I finally met 
some other, uh, well, young adults at that point that share that interest and love of meteorology. It's hard to explain why that is. I mean, as a little kid, I drove my parents crazy. First of all, they could never really watch the news because I would keep changing every, all this, to get every weather forecast from every station. And then I would do that with the radio, okay? And I remember sometimes, I remember I'd overhear when maybe a neighbor was in, and I'd hear my parents say, we don't know what's wrong with him. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just the weather, the weather, the weather. I love sports also, I must admit. So I wasn't just weather. But um, uh, anyway, as I said, until I finally met others, it was crazy. When we go to the playground to play ball with my friends, you know, I could just look up at the position of the sun and I knew what time it was. They thought I was crazy. But, you know, that's just the interest um, I had. The other thing that I had uh, was a lot of smart friends. Uh, where I grew up it was a really bright group and it was great because I think we spurred each other on. Now, my best subject was math. And I could compete with my three friends in math, but when it came to all the other subjects, they were just, they were just too smart. So, but that's good when, you, when you're around uh, people like that. It's, it's very good. And when I say I'm good in math, so this is true. I, this sounds bizarre. So when I was three years old, I could tell time. Remember, there's no digital back then, right? You had to really know how to tell time. I also could double numbers. Like I could go, you know, one, one and one is two, two and two is four, and then eight and 16, 32, you know, 64. 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, 8192, 16384. That's where I stopped. Um, and so I remember we had a neighbor when I was maybe three, four, five years old doing this. And he'd come over and he'd listen to this and he'd go, I hate that kid. I hate that kid. But okay, whatever it was, um, you know, but I, I wasn't all around like some of my friends were. But in any event, as I said, um, I had a good childhood though, a great neighborhood where I grew up. And um, so when I started to study meteorology in college, um, you know, things really were good because I was very focused and that was very important. So I got my degree in meteorology and while I was, um, uh, let's see now, okay, so I wanted to work after I graduated. Uh, I tried with the National Weather Service, I tried with private weather services, I just couldn't get a job. So I continued on to graduate school. This was at NYU. So both City College of New York and NYU, I was in the School of Engineering and Science because meteorology is all physics and math. So in fact, you take math, I remember those classes, I'd be, there'd be like three meteorology majors and 20 engineering majors you know, in those math classes. So, so that's what I was doing. Fortunately, I was very motivated. If I wasn't motivated, I know I wouldn't have gotten through it because uh, it is pretty rigorous. And I've come across uh, some young people and some people who aren't even young anymore that love weather but, and tried to major in college but couldn't get through either the math or the physics. You know, and I would always say to them, I said, look, you know, take heart because you can always have it as a hobby. Nobody can ever take that away from you. So as an interest and a hobby, uh, you know, you'll always have it. Uh, anyway, I was very fortunate um, in graduate school. Um, it, a lot of the, the coursework was very theoretical, and I kind of got a sense I wanted to be on the practical side of the field, you know, the actual forecasting. The real heroes in the meteorology field are the PhDs because they're the ones who create and develop all the computer models that people like myself, meteorologists who are forecasters, can take advantage of that. They're tremendous aids, even more so now than ever, in forecasting. So, so that's kind of what happened. In graduate school, something really important happened. There was a professor, his name was Vinnie Cardone, and he was one of the most brilliant but very normal people that I, I've ever met. Uh, it was like he had a PhD uh, like in meteorology, oceanography, math, and physics. But he was very human and very approachable. And in graduate school, a lot of the classes were very theoretical. And there really wasn't even one class that was truly dedicated to weather forecasting. And so I went up to him one day, because he was very approachable, and I said, Vinny, I said, 
you know, why is there no synoptic forecasting course, synoptic meteorology? I said, boy, if you would only teach it, that would be great. And he said, well, he says, why don't you start a petition? If you get enough signatures, I'll be delighted to teach the class. So I went around to some of my fellow graduate students in the meteorology department, and I managed to get nine signatures. Well, in graduate school in meteorology, that's enough. And so he taught the course, and I think I learned more in that one course than all the others combined. And it really came in handy, believe it or not, for me, several years later in the blizzard of 78. And the reason that is, is because in that era, those who were, you know, they might have been more experienced in forecasting, but those who were getting older and didn't have the advantage of the college education or that particular class that I had, would not have the confidence, perhaps, that that storm would take place. Nowadays, it's very common if you see a forecast 48 or 72 hours out and you see the snowfall accumulations, very often that's based on a storm that hasn't even formed yet. And yet forecasters are trying to tell you, you know, how much snow are you going to get. Think about that for a minute. But now the computer models are good enough where you can sometimes and often do that or at least get close. But if you go back to the blizzard of 78, 45 years ago, it wasn't like that. The computer models, and we still had them, were just vaguely hinting at something. But it took a huge leap on my part to go from that to what I thought would happen. But everything, I would say of my interest in weather, the winter storms, definitely is my cup of tea. I mean, that's my wheelhouse. Doesn't mean I got every one of them right. I certainly didn't. But, uh, but I mean, that's where my interest was greatest. That's where I think my knowledge was strongest. I just worked so hard on them. And um, through that course that Vinny taught, you come to realize in weather that things kind of happen usually from the top down. So if you have a disturbance way up at 15, 20,000 feet in the atmosphere, uh, and it's a strong one, and it's moving into the right location, you're going to get the storm to develop on the surface. And that's what was involved in that particular forecast. So it's a long time ago, uh, but it's hard to, for me to really see that many classic situations like that with the cold air in place and, and, and everything that I could see was going to happen. All right, so enough about that storm for a moment. There's one other thing I wanted to tell you, because I was influenced by one on-air weather presenter in New York when I was a kid. His name was Tex Antoine, and he had a very unique way of presenting. He was very artistic. So and this is like in the late 50s and 60s. So he would discuss you know, the weather map. Then he would do the commercial himself, and then he would do the forecast. And when he did the commercial, he could either turn a cup of Savarin coffee into a smiling face of a lovely lady, or he could take the lady's smiling face and turn it into a cup of Savarin coffee. He could do it either way. It was mesmerizing. Uh, and he was also a great communicator. Interestingly enough, he wasn't even a meteorologist. But he worked for NBC, and the National Weather Service was right there in Rockefeller Center where NBC was. So all he had to do was go up one flight or down one flight, whichever it was, and the meteorologist in charge would brief him, and he would be able to explain what was going to happen. And there are two things that's, that I remember about him that had tremendous impact on me. Okay, remember, I love the chance of snowstorms. So one day, and all he had was like an easel and a magic marker and like a couple of cardboards. That's all he had. Like a cardboard outline of the United States and a cardboard outline of the New York area. So he's got his cardboard thing, and he, he comes on one evening, and he's, and he's talking about what's going to happen. He goes, he puts, an, he puts an H in southern Canada. And then he looks at the camera, and he goes, cold high to the north. This is in the winter. And then he puts an L in the Gulf of Mexico. And he looks at the camera, and he goes, warm low to the south. And then he goes, heh, 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 heh. That's it. He's got me. I know what that means. That means this could be the setup to bring a snowstorm, which indeed happened. So I just found him very, very relatable, or really like he's talking to me, which of course he's talking to everybody. All right, that's one story. The other Tex Antoine story, it had. Uh, uh, 
Oh, so you want me to use this? Oh. Wait, we're having a little bit of a frequency problem. By the way, for your sake, I also had a frequency problem. I was on the air too much. So just, uh, anyway. So as far as you can get away from that mic. From that mic. Okay. This is good. All right. You hear me. All right, so I'm just going to finish this Tex Antoine story. So I'm in high school. High school for me was about a 13-block walk. And I'm walking home from high school. This was the day before Thanksgiving, maybe in the early 60s, mid-60s, whatever. Anyway, and I'm looking at the sky. It's like a leaden gray. It just looks like snow. It feels like snow. It smells like snow. But it doesn't snow. All right? OK. So I get home, and I turn on Tex Antoine that evening. And he used to start the broadcast with like a saying. And this is what he said. He said, I must admit the feeling of snow was in the air. But you'll have to admit, for Thanksgiving is kind of rare. And I went, wow. He is really talking to me. You know, he's like telling me what I experienced. That's unbelievable. And he did it poetically and all that. So he had a lot of talent. So in terms of the most talented weather presenter, uh, I think it was, it, it was him. So that had an effect. So if there was somebody that really, you might say, uh, not a mentor, but somebody I would really look up to when I was a kid, uh, he would have been the one. So in any event, um, I was very lucky because I did love weather. I never really pictured myself. Away from that. I never really pictured myself, um, you know, on television or anything like that for sure. And so when I got started, um, how did I get started? So while I was in graduate school, remember I wanted to work, couldn't get a job, but I was in graduate school, had that great professor, Vinnie Cardone, great course. They used to have every day these daily weather discussions for the faculty and staff. And I started to do them occasionally. And I really liked talking about the weather situation and what was going to happen. And I started doing it more and more. And then one day, somebody, one of the professors who was really working in air pollution and environmental science, he said, Harvey, he said, you know, I see you really love doing this. He says, I know the general manager of a small radio station in New Rochelle, New York. And I know they'd love to have a meteorologist do some reports for them. So I said, that's interesting. He said, why don't you get in touch with them? So I did. And um, they said, yeah, that'd be great. We'd love to have you do that. So I started doing that. And I did some of the reports right from the weather lab at NYU, where I was in graduate school. Now, this is the truth. I was already two and a half years old. And the first report I ever did for that radio station, OK, was being, it was not live, OK? It was on the phone, and I wrote everything out ahead of time. And yet, I had to do it in one breath. Because at the end of the breath was <laughs> <laughs> OK? Now, you know, that, that story is funny, but it probably would be helpful to younger people because it lets you know how you can go from one place to another if you work hard enough, you really have the interest and the love and joy, and you get the opportunity. Uh, but that's how it all started for me. But just having that little experience at that little radio station for no money, OK? Oh, by the way, OK, that's not exactly true. The first month, I didn't make any money. But then the general manager called me of the radio station after a month. And he said, Harvey, you're doing one heck of a job for us. He said, you know what we're going to start doing? I go. No idea. He said, we're going to start taking $5 from here, and $5 from there, and $5 from I don't even know where. And by golly, we're going to start giving you $15 a week. <laughs> and after a month, you're going to have $60. And after a year, you're going to have over $700. And I know that's going to come in awfully handy. All right? So how did I react to that? Well. I did kind of compute that I'm not going to be able to retire on this. Uh, but I also, being good in math, realized that $15 a week is better than zero. So I said, oh, thank you very much, and, you know, and, and so on. So I wound up doing that for five months, but it helped me get my first job, 
which was at a private weather service, White Plains, New York, Westchester County Airport. And our job mostly was to prepare weather briefings um, for pilots. And these were pilots who were flying for companies like Xerox and IBM. They'd be flying the executives all over the country or all over the world, which was a great forecasting experience. And we had four phones there, you know, because pilots would be calling in. As usually you're alone on shift and you gotta, you're talking to one, you put them a hold, you answer the other, get back to that one. All right, anyway. But we also had a couple of radio stations that we also did weather for. One in White Plains, New York, one in Greenwich, Connecticut, and one in New York, WMCA, a bigger station, but only for storms for them. But believe it or not, having that five-month experience doing weather on that little radio station in New Rochelle was probably what really got me that job. The pay, when I realized how many hours it was, was probably illegal. Uh, it was probably below minimum wage. And I remember in graduate school, one of the professors, when I told him what I was doing, he said, you don't want to do that. And I said, why? He said, because the private weather services are the sweatshops of the industry. And I said, yeah, but that's where, that's where my interest is, you know? Uh, I was pretty insulted. Well, if you want to know what the money was, I mean, this was in 1972. So it was $7,200 a year, which meant it was $138 a week. But this is the shift I had to work. 4 a.m. to 1 p.m., Monday through Friday, and either Saturday or Sunday, 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. So that's 59 hours, 138, a little over $2 an hour. I think it was below minimum wage. It was probably illegal. But it was, you know, it was a great experience. And so one day, I still did the same thing. I still wrote everything out for the radio stations. And then one morning, it was very foggy, and I was... Um, I had like four different pilots on all our different phones on hold, and I could hear one of the radio stations had a direct line to uh, our weather office at the airport, and I was being introduced. And so I made a mad dash over there, had no time to prepare anything, but got through it okay, and then never wrote anything out again. <laughs> but I guess I just had to be forced into that situation to prove it to myself. So now talking about weather, you know, I'm more comfortable now doing it, and radio, and the weather service. And then I get a call from a friend of mine, meteorologist friend, who actually was doing the weather at WCBS-TV in New York at the time. Alan Casper was his name. And he says, Harvey, he says, I have a sister living in Rhode Island. She knows the general manager of one of the TV stations. They're looking for a professional meteorologist. They, they don't have a professional meteorologist. This was in 1974. And I said, oh, Alan, that's so nice of you to let me know. I said, I, I, I could never do TV. Are you crazy? And he goes, well, you know, you said the same thing about radio. Now it's OK. I said, yeah, but, but you can hide on radio. I mean, I could be in the bathroom and still be doing it. But you can't hide from a camera. And he said, well, it's up to you. you know. So I thought about it. I thought about it. And I decided to give the television station a call. And I did. And they agreed to let me come up and do an audition. All right? Now, this is the one and only time in my entire life that I was able to do self-hypnosis. <laughs> I said to myself, look, you're doing this for the experience. You have zero chance of getting the job. You have zero television experience. You're not going to be hired as the chief meteorologist in Providence, Rhode Island. You're doing this for the experience. So I went up there, and because of this one and only time, I wasn't really nervous about it, OK? I, you know, I just figured I'm just doing it for the experience. So I, I get into the TV station. We're all ready to do the audition. And just as I get ready to start, someone over the loudspeaker says, will someone take his glasses off? <laughs> I guess I was using glasses for dry. I'm not even thinking like that. OK, fine. They take We're ready to start. Oh, loudspeaker again. Well, someone put some makeup on him. <laughs> OK, someone slaps some beard cover on me. All right. And I do the audition, and uh, I drive back to New York, and I never give it another thought. Okay. I didn't even call to thank them. That's how ridiculous I was. So remember, I'm working this 4 AM to 1 PM shift, and I'm a young person. So you're trying to have a little bit of a nightlife. Well, the only way to do that is to sleep only like three hours or sleep in two halves. So I was sleeping in two halves. 
And I'd like collapse in the afternoon, maybe from two to four or whatever it was. And I remember whenever getting up from one of those naps, I thought I was in the twilight zone. I mean, didn't even know what world I was in because it's really unnatural. Well, anyway, one of those times when I'm in one of these weird afternoon naps, the phone rings. And I pick it up and go, hello? <laughs> Hi, Harvey, this is, um, yeah, yeah, this is Bob Kincaid, the program director at WPRI TV in Providence. Oh, hi, Bob. Uh, yeah, I just want to let you know that we'd like you to become our chief meteorologist. <laughs> now, anybody here, I know young people couldn't possibly see it, ever see uh, Jackie Gleason, Audrey Meadows, Art Carney, the honeymooners? Okay. He says, we'd like you to become our chief meteorologist. And I go, um, 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 Ralph Cramden just takes over <laughs> inside me. So I instantly computed in my head, oh my goodness, they're actually going to offer me this, which means they think they're getting the person that was involved in self-hypnosis. <laughs> they have no idea that they'll have a basket case on their hands. I feel terrible for them. But I also realized there was a point in my life where I had to take the chance, OK? So I accepted it. One interesting thing, I asked for something a little bizarre. Normally, if you were doing something like that, they'd expect you to be there you know, in two weeks. You'd notice where you're working, and you move up, and that's it. Okay. So this was like in mid-May. And I said, um, would it be OK if I didn't start until July 1st? And they go, oh, well, yeah, I think so, because it's the summer anyway. OK. Now, why did I do that? Well, there was a young lady that I'd only dated two or three times from New York. And I wanted to kind of see if this could possibly go anywhere or not. You know, because I liked her, she seemed to like me, and I figured if I go to Providence, it's never going to have a chance to find out. So they were nice, and so I did spend a fair amount of time with that young lady. Her first name was Lorraine. We've been married almost 48 years. So that was a good decision, and I thank them for allowing me to do that. Um, okay, so anyway, but still the issue is going to be I'm going to go up there and I know I'm going to be a wreck, okay? And so I remember it was, I started on July 1st and the night before, June 30th, 1974, a, a friend all the way back to childhood was getting married and I was invited to the wedding. And I kind of knew while I was at that wedding like, this is the end of this part of my life, and now I'm going to begin the next section of my life, which probably will be a disaster, but I'm going to give it a try. So moved up to Providence, and I am so lucky that they gave me, a ch when I say a chance, I mean it was at least two months before I ever smiled on the air, <laughs> all right? Because if I had tried to, it would have looked something like this. <laughs> OK? Because my facial muscles were so tight. And the very first time I was on the air, I actually thought that my heart was going to come flying out of my chest. I really thought that. And I'm saying to myself, I don't get this. Why are there two people inside of me? One determined to do really well, and the other one saying, no way, no way. It's just weird. But Whatever it was, I, I, you know, and I can prove to you that I'm not kidding about this, because about two weeks in, the anchor man, Walter Cryan, it was after the early news, and I didn't have to hear what the other person was saying on the phone. I could figure it out, because he was saying, well, no, actually, he's a very nice person. It's like, who's this stiff on the air? OK? So that's why every day I went into work, I figured I'm going to get fired. But I figured, you know, my gosh, um, if they do that, I could just walk out of the state. Smallest state, shortest walk, you know. Um, but anyway, so they were, thankfully they gave me a chance. And then after a couple of months, little by little, I started to get more comfortable. But it was much more like turning up a dimmer switch than it was like turning on a light. It wasn't anything like that. So the one thing I can say, though, is that when, when you go through something like that and you're fortunate enough to have it work out, in my case, immensely well in the long run, you never forget that. And you really appreciate things a lot more. And I think that what it also did is the many interns that I had 
college students majoring in meteorology while I was working at the television stations. Um, I always wanted it to be an enjoyable experience for them. First of all, I knew they were taking a very tough course load, and I didn't want to add more pressure. So um, it was very pleasant, and I tried to make it uh, very human. And I never assumed that they were going to learn everything quickly, because I did. I'm a slow learner. A lot of them were quick learners. But I always erred on that side. And, uh, and it's really nice that so many of them um, you know, are working all around the country. Uh, well, I, you know, you're, I, you, well, you probably watch Boston most of the time. But if you ever watched uh, WMUR, uh, Channel 9 in Manchester, New Hampshire, their chief meteorologist, Mike Haddad, is a former intern of mine. Um, in Boston, on NBC uh, uh, 10, in the mornings during the weekdays, Matt Noyes, who's a crackerjack meteorologist, he was my intern for two summers. Um, in New York City, Lee Goldberg is the chief meteorologist at WABC in New York. He's also seen nationally once in a while. He was an intern of mine, and, and many others. So uh, that's really great, and I'm really happy you know, all of that worked out. So, Anyway, I, I spent my, my time at Channel 7, and um, you know, I never really thought that I would have ever lasted as long as I did, because as the mayor had mentioned, you know, there was Bruce Schwegler on WBC, there was Dick Albert on WCBB, and I was on Channel 7. But in those years, like the late 70s into the 80s, Channels 4 and 5 were so strong. I mean, they were so strong. They had such large viewership. They had great anchor teams, a lot of personality, a great promotion. They're out in the community. And um, at Channel 7, it seemed like it was a revolving door of news anchors. And um, I, I always wondered, why do they keep changing the news anchors? I mean, you know, we're, we're like in last place in the ratings. Haven't they figured out the common denominator is me? <laughs> you know, you know it, it was crazy. But um, anyway, well, the opportunity came up. Uh, what a lot of people didn't realize, Dick Albert, who uh, very uh, sadly we lost about five years ago, um, great meteorologist, great guy, you know if you watch him, very affable, um, very folksy, and that's who he was. It wasn't an act, that's who he was. And we had become friends, even though we were direct competitors for a quarter of a century. Now, I don't think this ever happened before in the industry. Two meteorologists at competing stations for a quarter of a century then joined forces. But we did that in 2002, because we would see each other at conferences. And there was always this annual broadcast meteorology conference with television meteorologists from all around the country. And back in a certain era in the industry, you could bring your wives. And we'd go out to dinner a couple of times. And my wife, Lorraine, and Dick's wife, Marianne, they're both in psychology. They hit it off. Dick loved tennis. I loved tennis. Because of our late hours, we'd play in the late mornings on some weekdays. And we both legitimately loved weather. So uh, Dick wanted to lighten his load. Channel 5 was thinking out of the box. Um, and I did go over, and we had about six and a half great years together. Uh, we considered every afternoon that we worked together adult weather camp. OK, <laughs> except we were more like kids than adults. But um, it, was, it was really great. And, uh, and then I was able to spend many more years um, at Channel 5. So, that's just a little, we just wanted to give you a little bit so you know a little more about that. I haven't forgotten our topic of climate change, and I'm going to get, it, get to it right now. All right, so as we start this, a few things I want you to understand. Um, my goal is to try to put this in, in proper perspective as best as I can. All right? The first thing we need to know is the difference between weather and climate. So weather is what's going on right there, OK? When you hear weather forecast, usually it's for a few days, maybe up to seven days. Um, that's weather, all right? Climate is the average of the weather over a long period of time, all right? So there is, they're related, but there is a distinction. And I'm a meteorologist involved in forecasting the weather. I'm not a climatologist or a climate scientist. But of course, I've tried to keep up with it. Some of these conferences I mentioned, there would be short courses on climate change that I would attend. So that's one thing. The other thing to remember is how weather even happens. All right? So we've got the sun up there. All right? And because of the way the Earth revolves around the sun, the planet doesn't get heated equally. So you know, rays are more direct, less direct in different parts of the world at different times. 
So now you start temperature differences. Once you have temperature differences, it's one of the simplest things in physics, it's directly proportional to pressure difference and wind difference. Wind is the movement of air. So the atmosphere is constantly trying to achieve a balance because it's out of balance because of the differential heating of the planet. And that's how we get our weather disturbances and our fronts and our storms. And we're at a very interesting latitude where often the battle zone between the cold air from the north and the warm air from the south collides somewhere near us. So we have, on average, an active weather pattern. We have a tremendous moisture source to our east, the Atlantic Ocean, that we all know about. And so that's what starts the whole thing. So climate change and what's going on with that, you have to realize that that is a superimposed effect. The, the weather and all of these things that happen, the storms and changes and the seasons, that's always been the case. So for example, if somebody says to you, Hurricane Ian, uh, that you know, really decimated part of the west coast of Florida, that that was caused by climate change. To me, that's a fallacious statement, okay? Climate change didn't cause that storm. Storms like that have always occurred. Do you know that here in New England, in 1938, which was the greatest natural disaster to hit New England, the winds reached a top Blue Hill Observatory, okay, in Milton, Mass., about 10 miles southwest of Boston, elevation 600 feet, there was a wind gust of 186 miles per hour. That's up here, okay? So the atmosphere is capable of a lot. June 9th, 1953, the Worcester tornado is actually rated as one of the 20 worst tornadoes in the United States, all right? Uh, there was a book, I'm trying to remember now, um, I think it's um, 84 minutes, 94 lives. That was on the ground and the path that it took for 84 minutes and 94 lives were lost, most of them in northern Worcester, around Holy Cross. They were really hit very, very hard. So the point is, you're surprised to hear that. Some of you didn't know about that because we're not Tornado Alley. We don't get anywhere near as many tornadoes as other parts of the country. But it's not an accident when it happens. It means that atmospheric conditions that are necessary to produce something like that can and do happen here. It just doesn't happen with the frequency that it happens in other parts of the country. But the setup has happened and will undoubtedly you know, happen again. Same thing like the hurricane of 38. Now in the 1950s, we actually had a rash of hurricanes come up the East Coast before climate change. If that were to happen now, the word would probably be, that's climate change. That's got to be climate change. Probably not. But is climate change real and a concern? And I would say, yes, it is. Because here is what is happening. It's very simple. And now I'm going to get into uh, the, uh, the little PowerPoint that I brought with me. I okay? thought I brought it for nothing. Um, <laughs> I, I am going to get to it. So the first thing I want to let you know um, is if you want to find out more about climate change, there's a great, great website. It's called climatecentral.org, climatecentral, one word, dot O-R-G. And the presentation that I'm going to show you here graphically, they're the ones that really put it together because they actually provide climate change graphics to all TV stations all around the country. Not all use them, but they provide them. And it's also very, very good for something like this. It's very educational and informational. So the title of this, you see it says Climate Central down there. So it's Climate Central, all combined, just one word, dot O-R-G, if you want to learn a lot more about climate change. So here is the idea. The idea is that it's simple, but it is serious. The third S, I have to be honest, I may take a little issue with. Not so easy to solve. Okay, we are going to get into that. All right, so when I say it's simple, here's what we're talking about. Simply, uh, the burning of coal and oil, a byproduct of that is to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas. So what that means is the more carbon dioxide that's up there, when we get a day, normally let's say you have a sunny day and a clear night. You're of course warm up during the day, 
you cool off at night. But at night, when you have a lot of greenhouse gases up there, some of the heat that's trying to escape back out to space gets trapped. And so the nights are averaging a bigger warm up than the days. And that does make sense with the idea of greenhouse gases. And it doesn't take much in terms of the percentage of gases in the atmosphere because we're 99% nitrogen and oxygen. And really just trace amounts of greenhouse gases. There's water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. But carbon dioxide, one of the problems is once it's up in the atmosphere, it's there for quite a while, like about 50 years. That's one of the reasons why I say this is difficult to solve. We can mitigate, we can adapt, but it's going to be a challenge, and it's a worldwide challenge to solve. Okay? So again, the effect is not really that complicated. We get direct rays from the sun, heats us up, all right? Some of it gets reflected back to space, but some is absorbed, as we know, and most of the heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases, and then it gets radiated in all directions. But one of the directions is back down to the Earth. It's trapping some of the heat. Now, this was actually talked about a long time ago, even in the 1800s, all right? But that's before the Industrial Revolution. That's really what's done that when you look at the number of automobiles in the world and things like that. So the Industrial Revolution, by the way, um, I'm just going to be pointing out some different things. I try to, as best I can, stay apolitical because I'm a meteorologist, a scientist, you know, but of course politics has bled into this to be sure. Um, but, you know, so here it was talked about. But I have to be honest with you, in, 19, in the 1970s, I think it was around 1974, Time Magazine had a headline in one of their editions, uh, The Ice Age Cometh. There was some talk of actually getting colder, all right? We have to remember that there are lots of cycles in weather, all right? As I mentioned, the differential heating of the planet starts the whole thing going. But there are some repetitive patterns that occur. We don't know all of them, and it's complicated how all of them interact. That's why long-range forecasting is a challenge, to be sure. But remember, we have all of that going on. So the best way I want you to think of this is that the general circulation of the atmosphere, the jet stream, all started by the differential heating of the planet, all right? That's always going to be the main driving force of our weather. The increase in greenhouse gases is being superimposed on the general circulation of the atmosphere, okay? It's almost like it's putting it a little bit on steroids, so to speak. That is the way, really, to look at this. So when you talk about Hurricane Ian and what it did to parts of the west coast of Florida, it was always going to be there. But the ocean water temperatures were running about two or three degrees above average off the west coast of Florida. So that probably allowed the storm to strengthen a little bit more than it otherwise would have or maintain its strength longer than it otherwise would have. And when you get up into those higher categories of wind, it's not just, well, what's the difference? You know, 130 miles per hour, 140 miles per hour. They're both horrible. But it does make a big difference because the increase in wind and the effects are not linear. They're what we call like logarithmic or a little more exponential. So just increasing the wind 10, 15, 20 miles per hour really takes on all sorts of different levels of damage, like storm surge and waves and amount of rain uh, you know, to cause freshwater flooding, as well as all the other effects, and the wind, of course. So that's the way to look at it. It's, a super, it's superimposed on the general circulation of the atmosphere. So that's why I think it's wrong when sometimes political figures, for political reasons, will just say, oh, yeah, that storm was, yeah, it's caused by climate change. No, it was probably made a little bit worse by climate change, which is significant. All right? And also, we've seen the most warming in the polar regions. Okay? That's why a lot of the glaciers are melting and polar ice caps. And that has an effect on the jet stream. So it can alter the weather patterns some. That's what, that's the way to look at, at this whole thing. All right, so we burn fossil fuels, we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, 
And so therefore, by burning coal, oil, and natural gas, we as human beings are warming the planet. And that's called anthropogenic warming. Now, if you look at this, okay, we're going to take a look at the increase in temperatures on average. And notice it's definitely been getting warmer, uh, as well as the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the uh, orange or red color is the temperature, and the blue line is the carbon dioxide. Now, of course, the temperatures have lots of fluctuations up and down, right? But if you average that, you will see it's moving in the same direction as the increase in carbon dioxide. Certainly, this is extremely suggestive that the two are directly related to each other. Okay? And this is just one city, one example, uh, Oklahoma City. Their average temperature has gone up a couple of degrees in the last 50 years. Now, of course, you know, some people say, well, hey, that, you know, think about the winter. If it's a little warm in the winter, that's good. Why should I mind? But there's all sorts of different effects. Think if you're a farmer in a certain part of the country and the weather patterns get altered. Now, your farmland becomes dry land. Okay, instead of being able to grow crops, you're getting a lot of droughts and fires. So there's all sorts of ramifications uh, that come about with the change. So this is Philadelphia, for example. And you might see why there was a little talk about mini ice age in the 70s, because there was a little cooling going on. But certainly over the last 50 years, the average temperature has been going up. So this is what I mean. The last part of the talk, which talks about how this is solvable, and I say, I think we can mitigate. Really, the thinking is, in the shorter term, going forward, if we can cut our emissions, we will slow the rate of warming. But there's still going to be warming that's going to go on, at least in the near term, relatively speaking. But you can see the blue line, the rate of warming will be slower if we cut the emissions as if we just keep going the way we're going. And by the way, I'm talking about the world, all right, not just the United States, because that's where you do get into some political arguments where some people say, well, you know, why should we spend all this money and da 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 Look at China, look at India, they're not doing anything, so it's probably not even going to have much of an effect. And you can argue this all over the place, you know, um, but of course, you know, somebody's got a lead. There's all sorts of different ways to talk about it, but that's really what we're talking about. All right, so it's not that complicated, but it is serious, okay? So again, we know the increase in carbon dioxide means a warming, but it also has always been predicted that there would be more extreme weather. And extreme weather is not good for any of us. It's not good in terms of it's costly, it can cost lives, property damage, all sorts of things. I mean. Look at the rain. You talk about extremes, at least for the last, you know, six, nine months. Look at the western part of the country. Look at California. I mean, they've gone from droughts to terrible storms and floods and all this and that. But both are bad. The extremes are not good. And so if this is leading to more extremes, which was predicted and seems to be happening, that's a problem. It can be costly, both in terms of property and possibly in terms of life as well, human life. All right, so this is just showing you that relatively small changes in the averages can actually make big exchange in the extremes. If you just shift that curve over to the right, so that instead of having equal amount of cold and equal amount of warm, if we're warm most of the time, there's going to be a change. So this is what I want you to know. This is another thing about climate change that a lot of people confuse, get confused. Let's say next winter we happen to have a cold winter or a snowy winter, all right? There will be a lot of people saying, wait a minute, I, look at this. I thought we're not supposed to have winters like this anymore because of climate change. No, that's not what it means. Remember, climate is the average weather. So what a responsible statement, in my opinion, would be going forward, it's much more likely that we're going to have a larger number of winters above average in temperature than below average in temperature. It doesn't mean we'll never be below average in temperature. 2014-15 winter was unbelievable from late January into March. Incredible storms, you know it, probably the most intense winter weather period in terms of amount of snow and cold uh, that we've had over a concentrated several-week period of time with no break in the cold, so it was all additive. 
you know, there wasn't much melting because it never warmed much. So that can still happen, all right? But, you know, a lot of people are going to say, ah, look at this climate change talk. See, they, look at this. Look how cold it is, how snowy it is. People can have short memories, but you can't have short memories if you're talking about climate because it's the average weather over a longer period of time. So that's what I want you to realize. Um, okay. So this is just showing you, this, is, th this kind of supports what I just said. So if you look at the orange, which is record high temperatures, and you look at the purple, which is record low temperatures, and you can see in the most recent decades, the record high temperatures are beating out, the number of days with record high temperatures beating out, or the number of records per year is bringing, beating out the record cold temperatures. Okay, it doesn't mean it's never cold or there can never be a cold outbreak. You saw what happened in Buffalo with some lake effect snow. Actually, because the lakes were so mild, contributed to producing all that snow. Because the contrast, when you finally did get a real cold air mass over Great Lakes ocean water temperature warmer than normal, that creates a bigger contrast and a bigger lake effect snow effect. And that's what happened a couple of times this winter with them. But you can see what the trends are doing. Now, the snowfall patterns can be changing and seem to be regionally and seasonally as well. Overall, across the globe, less snow and shorter snow seasons. But locally, in any given area, you could still have the potential for bigger snow events in snowy areas. Now, yes, this winter, you know, if you're looking for cold, and especially if you're looking for snow, a dud. Would we agree on that? Right. OK. But the way we do um, climatological averages for Boston, they're done over the most recent 30 years. And then every 10 years, you up it by 10 years. So in other words, once we got to 2020, prior to that, like 2019, when we talked about records, uh, it would be comparing things to the averages would be from 1980 to 2010. Now when we compare it to the climate average, we're talking about 1990 to 2020. And when we made that jump about two years ago, guess what happened to Boston's average snowfall? It didn't go down. It went up. It actually went up because we actually had more blockbuster snowstorms. And that's not an accident. Because of the warming and the high levels of the atmosphere, it tends to disrupt the jet stream. And normally, on average, in the winter, the real, real bitter cold is locked up near the polar regions. But with all the warming, it's getting dislodged, it's getting displaced, it's altering the jet stream, and it's actually allowing the mid-latitudes to sometimes get some pretty impressive storms. And at times, it may be still cold enough for snow. Now, some of those storms, however, maybe if we go out 30, 40, 50 years, some of them that were borderline snow, close to the rain snow threshold, may wind up being rainstorms decades from now. Who knows? But at least in the shorter term of climate, the actual average snowfall has gone up. But the average temperature has also gone up. And you might think the two don't really go together. And they won't go together forever. If it continues to get warmer and warmer, then eventually that trend in the snowfall will then reverse and start to get lower because of some of the storms not being quite cold enough for snow. They would produce rain. So that's what we're talking about here. Now, again, on average, the growing season here is getting longer because our first frost in the fall, on average, is occurring later. And our last freeze of frost in the spring is occurring earlier. But on average, OK, does it mean that will work every year? All right? I've seen frost on Memorial Day weekend in places. It can still happen. You're never 100% safe. Um, my first day on Boston television, May 9th of 1977, snowstorm, OK? Uh, like 6 to 12 inches in Framingham, 20 inches in Princeton, uh, in, the Worc in the higher terrain of Worcester County, May 9th and 10th, OK? May 8th was Mother's Day. It was 63 degrees. May 9th, 10th, snowstorm, all right? So we are capable of you know, wild swings. We always have been. Um, OK, so that's the, the story there. Now, this is one of the big things, glaciers, the melting of the glaciers and the rising of sea level. And this is one of the big things why I think we've got a real concern going forward, OK? So we know that sea level is rising slowly but 
surely. So what that means is, let's say we get a pretty fierce nor'easter, or an ocean storm, it could be anything, a blizzard, nor'easter, hurricane, tropical storm. Well, if sea level is higher to begin with, then the same exact storm as, let's say, maybe 20 years ago, can actually produce a little bit more beach erosion and coastal flooding because you're starting with a higher water level to begin with. Now, with the warming of the ocean waters, the storm itself may be a little bit stronger. That's a second compounding effect. So now if the storm is a little bit stronger and sea level is a little bit higher, now you're going to get more beach erosion and more coastal flooding. So those are the concerns you know, going forward. Then if we look at the number of people who live along or near the coast, that's gone way up. The number of, number of structures, property, near and along the coast, that's gone way up. So if you add all those four things, rising sea level, the possibility that strong storms will be a little bit stronger, more people, more structures, more concern. So that's what we're talking about with this uh, issue. Now, it's very interesting that actually 93% of the extra heat is going into the oceans. So if you look at the oceans, all the yellow and orange colors are ocean temperatures that are averaging warmer than they used to. Very little is cooler, maybe close to where you know, ice caps are melting uh, may cause a temporary uh, cooling in some areas. But overall, uh, you can see the warming in the oceans. And this is a little concerning, very concerning. Sea level is definitely on the rise, okay, in the, in the, uh, in, as we look at the centuries going back and forth. But then you really see a pretty distinct change. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, higher tides going to mean more coastal flooding, a larger number uh, of days with coastal flooding. So that's, what's, you know, that's what we're seeing. And I'm not gonna, I don't want to dwell in Charleston, South Carolina, because we're not there. But um, this is a general little rule of thumb. One degree inch increase in our average temperature is about 4% more water vapor in the atmosphere. Why is that? Because warm air is capable of holding more moisture than cold air. So we expect and we are seeing a higher percentage of heavy precipitation events. Now, when I was still working more actively uh, in an everyday forecasting manner, uh, occasionally people, uh, somebody would write in and say, it just seems like we get more bad winds, you know, with damaging trees and wires are down and all this kind of stuff. Part of that's better reporting. We've got a whole Skywarn network of trained weather spotters. That's part of it. But no, it's real. And again, that's the idea that these storms can be a little bit stronger than they used to be or otherwise would be. Now, the average wind speed, interestingly enough, is not up. It's actually down. But the number of days with very strong winds are up. So it's, again, feast or famine. We can get some really bad storms, but then we can get maybe a larger period of tranquil weather. But when we get the storms, it can be pretty nasty more often than in the past. OK, and this is what this is showing you. This is showing you the increase in heaviest precipitation events. All right, it's an increase everywhere in the country. The greatest increase is here in the Northeast. And, you know, I remember, you know, in my first couple of decades, I mean, if you got an inch of precipitation out of a storm, which could be, if it was snow, maybe 10 inches or an inch of rain, that's a very significant amount. But we've had a lot of, with multiple inches of precipitation. There was one situation this past summer, even though overall we were kind of in a, in a mini drought situation, where there was like a narrow band with a little front that was stuck, 10 to 12 inches of snow around, uh, not snow, rain around Cranston, Rhode Island. That's like three months supply in like 24 to 48 hours. You hardly ever would see amounts like that out of a given storm. But we're seeing more frequent two, three, four inch amounts of precipitation out of a single storm. So that means we're getting wetter. So you may say, well, wait a second. OK, I can understand that. It's warmer world, wetter world, more precipitation. But why would there be more droughts, the extreme on the other end? Well, when you get into the drier periods, if it's hotter and the sun's 
you know, shining down, it's going to take the moisture out of the soil more quickly because it's hotter. So you can then go to the other extreme. So yes, you can have periods of drought and periods of heavy precipitation events. All right, now this is just giving you an example in Houston. Uh, rain on the wettest day uh, each year, what the heaviest amounts were. Uh, but you see overall it's going up with all the ups and downs. By the way, that big spike was Hurricane Harvey. Remember that gave like 40 inches of rain. Interesting, of course, the importance of that storm is the devastating rain, obviously. But what happened at that time was there was a certain group of people. I happened to be on vacation at that time. And some people wrote in and thought that the station wasn't allowing me on the air because the association of my name with that terrible storm, they didn't want people, OK? Then there were other people who thought, is Harvey just afraid to come to work? <laughs> now, neither was true. I was just on vacation at that time. It was you know, in the middle of the summer. But it's interesting, you know, the thoughts that that can go through people's minds. All right, so in terms of hurricanes and climate change, what do we know? Warmer water equals, you know, more fuel for these storms, OK? Um, we know that. That's going to produce heavier rain and a higher storm surge and stronger winds. All that potential with warmer ocean waters, OK? Um, but if you look at the drought, now you could see as the numbers get from top down, the farther down they go, the worse it is. And that drought index, which they use in the western US, which is really our, our fire zone, that's gone up. So it's uh, you know, more extremes clearly being shown uh, by this. And um, uh, it would make sense. Hotter years, higher fire risk. Because again, if it's hot and the skies are clear, sun is going gonna, is gonna to draw the moisture out of the soil. It's going to evaporate more quickly. Um, so serious, all right? Again, that's why it's serious. Uh, rising sea level, more extreme weather. And the thing is, so far we've talked about it mostly, except I mentioned the growing season, but we just talked about it from a weather point of view. But what about nature, health, the economy, and all of these other uh, effects? So you can look from the heavy rain events and you know, heavy snow events, the flooding, the droughts, the fires, the storms. There is no real evidence, by the way, that OK, let me explain some of these other. There, there's a multi-decadal oscillation that we know about in terms of hurricanes in the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. And the feeling was around 1995, it flipped to a more active period. So it's been more active, but not necessarily because of climate change. The best thinking uh, that I've seen from the people who study this is not necessarily that there will be more hurricanes, but there may be a higher percentage of strong or major hurricanes. That's the real concern, all right? And you know, even when you talk about a lot, sometimes you have a lot of names, but they're all, most of them are out at sea, and you don't think much about it. And sometimes you can have a relatively small number of storms, like in 1992. It was late August. It was the first tropical disturbance of the season in late August. It was Hurricane Andrew. And what it did to Homestead, Florida is unbelievable. So it only takes one, you know, even if it's not an active season. But if one of the few of them came your way, it's not an inactive season for you. So you've got to always remember that. Um, tornado is another thing. We're having a pretty active tornado time now. But overall, in the last 10, 20 years, the number of tornadoes seems to be actually down some. And could that really be? As I've seen from some uh, research, that the number of tornadoes may actually go down a little bit. Why is that? Because you've heard a lot about wind shear, the change of wind direction and speed with height. When you have that, that's what allows the air to begin to spin and can lead to thunderstorms. That's also dangerous for aviation. So you know, you think about it, the most dangerous times are takeoff and landing because there's no, not a lot of room for error. You're near the ground. So if you've got a severe thunderstorm or tornado, you get what we call a downburst. So you're trying to go up, it may drive the plane right into the ground. Or as you're trying to land, it can do that. So that's why it's very, very important in aviation, especially with takeoff and landing. 
But in any event, the reason is because of a gradual warming, the temperature difference between, let's say, the US-Canadian border and the Gulf Coast is a little bit less than it used to be. And if that's less, you're going to get a little bit less wind shear and all of that, which could mean a little bit less in terms of number of tornadoes. So it doesn't mean that because of climate change, every single thing is just worse, worse, this is worse, that's worse. This, you know, it's more complicated than that, and we're still learning about it as well. Um, OK, so here you can see uh, in 2019 talking about billion dollar disasters. Of course, we do know we have inflation, so when you talk about how costly a storm was 50 years ago compared to now, you have to take that into account. But even doing that, uh, you can see the trends you know, are, are going up uh, clearly. All right? This is important for animals and ecosystems. Now think about it, or, tr or diseases like tropical-borne diseases, like malaria. If we keep warming and warming, some of these that are normally at the tropical latitudes may begin to inch up north, maybe get into the southern part of the United States. So all the changing uh, effect of climate change, it's like a domino effect of other things. You could start to have mismatched timing between animals and food sources. Um, the great whites, they have to follow the food source. If the food source is now up off our waters, that's where they're going to be. So that all has effects. Um, you know, and also, you could have extinctions. You could have invasive species, you know, all these things. Now, what about health to us? For one thing, um, air quality overall can be, is usually worse in a warmer world. Uh, when, you have, when it's sunny, when it's hot, especially if there are a lot of automobiles out there and things like that. So there's a chemical reaction. All right, between that exhaust and all that warmth you know, from the sun and uh, you know, byproducts of that are low-level ozone, and that's an irritant. We need the ozone up above to diminish the effect of the ultraviolet rays of the sun, but down below, it's an irritant. All right, so more heat-related illnesses. You know, as you know, many parts of the world, I'm even here, but a, a, a lot of inner cities, I'm going to wrap in a minute, a lot of inner cities you have problems because there's not a lot of air conditioning. And if there isn't, heat waves are brutal. Especially inner cities, it traps the heat, the, the blacktop, the concrete, the bricks. It doesn't lose the heat of the day. You never cool down that much. It's real problems. And then you have the risk of uh, insect and foodborne diseases. But allergies, it's starting a little bit earlier and ending a little bit later. So now you have longer allergy seasons. And there's all sorts of effects for food and farming, stress, obviously, uh, on the animals, shifting planting zones, and you could have increased crop diseases and pests. So it can affect everything, our sp sports, outdoor activities. If it wasn't for snowmaking, I think the ski industry would be gone. It's too erratic now and too many warm incursions um, and all sorts of stuff. And this is just showing you just a little bit how much of a warming could lead to how much of all these different uh, effects. So very quickly, because I didn't touch on this, is it solvable? Again, right now the thinking is if we do the right things, maybe we slow the rate of warming. That's in the near term. There's a lot of different ways that we're getting an increase in greenhouse gases. Solar is obvious, most in the southwest, but even here, uh, I've been in touch with some people that have gone solar, and, and one month they actually made money. Money was paid to them because it gets put into a bank and, and all that. And wind, you know, wind energy. So clean, renewable sources of energy, always going to be a help. And this I want to talk about, electric vehicles. So before I retired, I got to do one interesting story on, on climate change, or as Station's calling it, forecasting our future. I was riding on the school buses in Beverly, which have gone electric. Now, I grew up in the Bronx. I had to take a bus and a train to get to college. I had to commute to college. And, you know, it's always frustrating when you just miss the bus. But what's even worse, as the bus pulls away, the thick black exhaust smoke goes blasting into your face. Well, I'm riding on this bus in Beverly. It's nice and quiet. Then I go back to examine the exhaust system, and there isn't one. So this, the cleanliness alone, the difference is immense in terms of that. And the final thing, buildings. And I'm not a structural engineer or an architect, but I can tell you that the seaport area of Boston, where there's been a lot of development, but it's a vulnerable area for flooding, for major storms and nor'easters. 
What they're doing in new buildings, they don't put the furnaces down in the lowest level or the basement. And they build higher foundations so that if you get some coastal flooding, that's mitigation. That's mitigating it. If you can't change it, you got to adapt to it. All right? If you do that with existing structures and you make changes, that's called retrofitting. That's a little more complicated. And of course, better building codes, stricter building codes to withstand higher wind and not have as much damage. So those are the things. I'm going to stop here because I went on for a while. But you great, attentive audience, and I appreciate that. So I thank you. Um, and uh, you know, I know there's going to be a meet and greet, but if there is time for some q and I'm happy to do it. OK. Um, of course, I don't know whether to turn left or right. You know. By the way, you will know this. I like to play tennis. So this is the position returning a serve. And you'd also like to know that sometimes, you know, when it, there's so many newscasts now, like, you know, it's continuous from 4 to 6.30, and weather's on a lot. And sometimes they have these little teases, and sometimes you're here, and sometimes you're there, and you're trying to set your graphics, and sometimes I don't know where I'm supposed to be. So I'd be in the middle between there and here, and I'm just going like this. Okay? Ready to move either way. Um, uh, yeah, let's take some questions and comments, if there are. Uh, yes, let's start right here. There, uh, yeah, there is some sense that Tornado Alley may be shifting a little bit because of a bit of a shift in the weather patterns. There also is a secondary area that's the interior southeast part of the United States. But even up here, it's a small sample, but the frequency seems to be up a little bit um, you know, in the northeast in New England. So yes, th th that's all part of you know, what can happen. You know, patterns change a little bit. Um, they're altered a little bit from what they were. Uh, you're going to have to speak loud. Yes, in the back. Did you please comment on the permafrost and the methane release? And that seems to be something that could overwhelm a lot. Uh, yeah, methane, is, that's a good, a good question. Because, um, you know, we usually talk about carbon dioxide. But methane is actually, as I understand it, worse, believe it or not. It's an even worse greenhouse gas, you know, than carbon dioxide. And um, I mean, it has many, I don't know, with cattle, and I'm not an expert in all that. But that also is a big contributor and a big concern. It isn't just carbon dioxide, OK? And maybe we'll talk more about that if we're exchanging directly with each other. Um, yes? Hi, I'm Jane Healy. I'm in Newbury Point's Resiliency Committee. Oh, great. And um, thank you so much. You are clearly an amazing communicator, and you learned. Um, and I'm wondering what role, well, I have two questions. I'll, I'll, ask the, I'll just ask one, really. For those of us who care about this issue and are yes. talking to others that might not know as much or might not quite buy it, what tips do you have for us to talk about it in a way that is received and productive? Yeah. Uh, the question is, um, you know, what is the way to, best way to talk about this uh, to people who, you know, who doubt it, you know, and, and all this and that? Um, I mean, it's a challenge. I mean, obviously, now that I'm no longer forecasting, you know, um, I, I like these opportunities, you know, to get together with people. So I'm making my little contribution, you know, that way. But you know that things, uh, as I said, are, are just... They're so politically charged. It's so difficult, and it's so challenging, you know, to try to just really try to separate, you know, the science from it. But but even then, if you're only talking about the science, like the, the stations involved in a project called Forecasting Our Future, it isn't just or so much the science of climate change. It is adapting. You know, like what's going on to, um, you know, to try to mitigate this. Um, and so on. And as like I said, it's so hard because some of the criticism when people say, oh, why are we going to throw all our money into this problem? First of all, you know, human beings can adapt. They'll survive. They always have. You know, they always will. And there are so many other areas you can put money into. You know, there, there's poverty. People are starving. I mean, that's always been talked about even when you look at the amount of money that goes into space exploration. Of course, arguments can be made. You know, also that money could be used for, you know, homeless people. You know, I mean, they're, they're worthy of legitimate discussions. It's just that there used to be more legitimate discussions back when. 
And uh, now it's just, you know, everything is just twisted and so political, you know, it nauseates me personally. Um, you know, but so I just think, you know, and all of us, whatever our roles are, uh, do our best to inform and educate and, you know, and speak honestly. And, you know, in my team, I'm just trying to put it as best I can. I'm not even an expert. I'm not an expert in the field, but at least the knowledge I do have um, to try to put it in perspective, you know, where it's a little bit understandable and you get a sense. But if you're being lied to, then it's tough. You know, if somebody's just saying, oh, this is, that's, uh, that's storm climate change. You know, and, um, you know, that's not, that's why the analogy, which may not be perfect, where I think it's like, you know, climate change, human-induced climate change, is like, it's, it's being thrown onto, all right, what exists, which is very complicated in itself, as we know, weather patterns and the general circulation of the atmosphere. So, you know, another thing is, it's not a, it's not a great or perfect comparison by any means, okay? But, okay. Um, the coronavirus. We don't know for sure how it started, do we? If we don't have data, if we don't have information, if it's being blocked from us or we can't find out, how can we know for sure? Now, even climate change. Okay, so the statistics are 97% of climate scientists are convinced this is real and this is a problem. It's not 100%. I know people in the field, more in the forecasting field, that just won't buy it. And if, you, if you're going to try to find something, like even what's going on on the West Coast, somebody is, you know, a, a meteorologist friend of mine, he sends me stuff and shows me, you know, the amounts of st the storms, what happened in the 1800s. He said, look, see, this happened in the 1800s. It wasn't climate change, you know. But I think he's more upset about everything being blamed on climate change, you see. And that's the problem. If, if that's what's being told, they actually defeat the argument they're trying to make. You know what I mean? By not seeming to come across as an honest broker of information. You know? It's a real problem. It's very, very frustrating. You know, I, there aren't easy answers. It's just that, you know, I mean, I don't know. There were times where, I don't know. I mean, w whatever it was. You, different people. I mean, you know. You know, Ted Kennedy or, uh, or whatever, Tip O'Neill and Newt Gingrich could actually compromise? I mean, you can't picture something like that today, you know, it's, which is sad in my opinion. But anyway, um, yes? I have probably more of a medical question. But I think Just ask Dr. Harv. It's okay. <laughs> Kidding. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's always been that. Is there a lot of truth to that? Yeah, there's definitely some truth to that. Um, you know, my, my own mother used to, t you know, would say, it's going to rain tomorrow. You know, and uh, y y the problem with those things are they work sometimes, but not all the time. And so, but you tend to remember, especially when it's not scientific, you remember the times it does work. Great story was, oh, could I just do this real quick? The, the, uh, the Farmer's Almanac, okay? The old Farmer's Almanac? Okay, so if you want to know what I think about the old Farmer's Almanac, no, wait a second. Okay, this is gonna shock you, okay? Because here I am, a supposed professional meteorologist, and what do I think of the old Farmer's Almanac? Well, as I said, it's gonna surprise you. It actually turns out that it's 100% correct. The old Farmer's Almanac is 100% correct. I bet you didn't expect that a professional meteorologist would admit to that, but it is 100% correct. All right. When it comes to sunrise, sunset, <laughs> moonrise, moonset, high tide, low tide, uh, lots of great farming tips, uh, great, you know, for agriculture, gardening. No, it's a great publication. Wonderful, Harvey. Okay, Thank you like that? You All right. By the way, um, the idea of trying to, 18 months ahead of time, do weather in groups of five days, like, you know, we're going to do February, like, you know, next year, whatever it may be. Imagine if we broke our whole group into 12 groups and everybody had a month. And you had a forecast like five days at a time next year for that particular month. Now, if you had February, chances are somewhere in there, you probably throw in a snowstorm. And you may be right. But lo and behold, imagine one where the professional meteorologists don't do so well. 
And somebody looks at the old farmer's almanac, and that happens to be a storm that they actually said, oh my God, look at those high-priced people on television. Oh my God, they're terrible. Look at the old farmer's almanac. But the final thing I'm going to say is, I don't really actually make fun of it at all, because one time I went up to Dublin, New Hampshire, to do a feature story. And the people who work for the Old Farmer's Almanac are wonderful people. And one, it's, once it's humanized to someone, why would you ever want to you know, say anything against it? But it's a great, seriously, is a great publication with lots of great information. But the parts about you know, the five days at a time, you just take it with a grain of salt. That's all right. Anyway.